So Gabby, so nice to see you. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm really well. Nice to see you too. Absolute pleasure. Um, I mean, obviously lockdown tis the season. How has it been for, for you and the family, Gabby? Um, it's been really interesting. The The idea of me having what is now what, nine, ten week career break <laughs> <laughs> and a reset. And, you know, if you'd said to me last year, you know, fancy 10 weeks off, Nick. No, when I say off, I've done a lot of other things, but 10 weeks off what you normally do, I'd have bitten your hand off because I love what I do, but I also, there's so many things that I want to get stuck into and, you know, things that I wanted to um, start. And it was impossible to do that because we're all on this treadmill of work, especially when you're self-employed, you're constantly doing, you know, your, your job and then things that are coming in because you don't know, you know, you don't know when things are going to stop. And as it turns out, it was around March, 2020. <laughs> And so I've, I've, I've tried to embrace the time and use it in a way that, you know, to do these things and, and having my kids as well, I've got twins who are nearly 15 and having my kids at home, I mean, they're always at home, but you know, having them here all the time and all of us being together is so rare because, you know, I work a lot of weekends and my husband also is in sport related business. So, you know, we're all kind of like, you know, like this, we spend a lot of time together but not as a four do you know what I mean we kind of yeah. in twos and silos of like threes and twos <laughs> so, um so it's been it's been really lovely actually just kind of breathing a bit and cementing you know but it's horrible what's going on what days like you know some days you feel positive about things and then you have days where the news is just horrendous whether at the beginning it was the the effects of the disease or whether it's the effect on the economy or whether it's the way politics is so mm-hmm. you know it's it's a real you know corona coaster as they call it don't they Corona coaster. I've not come across that one yet. No. Yeah, it's quite because I think that so many people I speak to feel sometimes feel really positive. And I can almost tell when my friends are, are lulling again because they disappear a bit. You know, I don't get a WhatsApp message. And I've got a really good friend who lives in central London, like right in Marlebone, mm-hmm. with three teenagers, no outdoor space, one bathroom between five of them, you know. So you, they're never all there at the same time. They're both actors, actually. So they're, they're always travelling. So they, they didn't realise that, actually, three teenage girls and one bathroom is a nightmare. You know, it's that kind of... And, and I feel like, you know, I feel like I need to check on her more than other people because I feel like she's, um, she's got a tough, you know, a tough asset. At the very beginning, when people weren't going out at all, you know, she was just feeling completely hemmed in and in central London as well. And everything you love about central London, why you'd want to live there, restaurants, cinemas, bars, you know, theatres, stops, you know, everything stops. There's no point almost being there, is there? It's like life's gone. So, um, so I feel like certain people, you kind of need to check on a bit more than other people, you know? Yeah, for sure. Definitely. And, and I wanted to ask you, Gabby, um, cause obviously you have worked consistently and you have really been, been nonstop and, you know, for our well-being, we know that rest is important. But like you say, for self-employed, it's the hardest thing to do at times. Have you struggled to kind of enter that mindset of going, all right, I need to just breathe now and not like still having going, I kind of be doing other things? Because I found that quite hard is like say, no, you can stop, Kel. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. It's, some days it's easier than others. Some days I feel um, guilty about not doing something, you know. And, um, and then other days I found it, amazingly easy to just stop and you know especially the weekends because I'm so used to working weekends and this bank holiday the last bank holiday we had I just loved it you know I was uh, outside going for runs going for walks you know played a bit of tennis did you know lots of lots of activity and at the end of it I felt like I'd had a holiday and it was you know that feeling when you have a holiday and you don't want to come back from your holiday it was a bit feeling like that going back into my on the Tuesday morning And so some days I do feel really like I should be doing something. What is it I should be doing? And other days, like I look at the book I'm reading and think, I should read more of them. And then think, what, why? What's, you know, (laughs) I'm not going to be tested on it. There's no, you know, we don't even know when I'm going back to work and what's going to happen. So every time I hear something on the news about, oh, footballers are going back into contact training or footballers are, you know, footballers are um, working in bigger groups and things, I think, okay, are we edging closer to the start of the season again? And then, there's a setback in some way, you know, and you kind of, I don't know, it just, there's no point almost second guessing, is there? We just no. have to be present really, isn't it? I think that's the best. Day to day. It's day to day, isn't it? Massively. Um, How often do we do that? You know, live day oh, to day. That's it. And there's usually so many distractions that are keeping us from being actually present that we are able just to exist in this, in this moment now for the first time in forever, I think. Have you done anything new? 
Um, do, do you know what's funny? I've done more running than I've ever done before. And I did the, I've been joking to my mum and dad because I, I did the marathon last year and I said, I've ran more than I did for any training last year. Um, but actually kind of getting outside and just trying to make use of when we were allowed to do the exercise a day. Um, and then since we've kind of been eased a little bit more, loads more time outside, I think, just because I'm appreciating it more than ever, I think. And we've um, had such amazing weather, haven't we? It's been ridiculous. So, yeah, so, yeah that, that has been, because at the very beginning when we had that really unseasonably warm end of March and I said to my husband, imagine being locked down in november you know and oh, when the yeah. sky hits the ground and it's you get five hours of daylight and you know i mean we we might yet be we don't know do we but at the time i thought that count our blessings that you know that the birds are out and it sounds you know that sounds like nature wants to come back and all of those lovely things were happening yeah it's so true um Gabby, so, I mean, you've had such an, uh, a fascinating life and I wasn't stalking by any means, but when I was able to go and just kind of, you know, read up on, on kind of your life so far, it was, it was so wonderful to do because you, you've done so much um, and through such different times. I want, let's go right back to the beginning because obviously um, starting with your childhood and, and your dad who was in the world of sport, what, what was life like growing up for, for you and your family? Um, it was quite um, nomadic. Because um, the nature of football, especially before we had windows of transfers, you know, footballers could be transferred on a Tuesday, you know, and be playing for somebody else on a Wednesday at any time of the year. So, you know, it, although he, he played for Leeds for 10 years, I was four when, when we left Leeds. And, um, and he was a footballer. He was a professional footballer. And, um, and I was four. My sister was three. My brother was one. So they had three kids under four. They were 26 years old. You know, so this young couple with lots of kids. And, and then we kind of just moved around a lot. You know, we moved to Coventry and then we moved to Vancouver and then we moved back to Coventry and then we moved. And by the time I was 10, we'd lived in a couple of different countries, in about six different cities. And, you know, it was, um, it was exciting, you know, because um, I think my mum made it exciting. So, you know, it was a new adventure. There were lots of new adventures. Um, and we didn't know any different, you know, that was his job. Wherever we went, he played for the team in that city. So I think a lot of footballers these days, especially the foreign players, are on so much money that they often leave their families in Madrid and come over for a, a season or two because they think we maybe might not last or players will have a base somewhere and, you know, they kind of and look at Peter Crouch. I mean, he went all over the country, didn't he, from his base in Surrey. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I, think, I think then... That wasn't a luxury you could afford because you, you didn't have money to buy more than one house. And, you know, so um, that was the other difference. I think people who think of you being a child of a footballer automatically assume that it was, you know, your your sheets were kind of, you know, paved in, you know, sprinkled with diamonds and you're, you know, you had, you know, kind of champagne for breakfast. And it was a we didn't you know, we didn't go to private school. We didn't have flash cars. We didn't go to, you know, flash holidays, really, or, you know, we had a couple of nice holidays when we were young, but we didn't have that kind of perceived idea of what, you know, it's like to be, because footballers were probably paid around the same as like a GP, you know, so that kind of, except that a GP works till they're 65, you know, and a footballer, his career could be over at any moment. Yeah. Uh, then. So, so it was a nice salary and a nice lifestyle, but not uh, in any shape or form flashy, you know, it was just mm -hmm. the, the, the most unique thing, I guess, about it was that people knew your dad, you know, so you were out in public and uh, you, you know, you're walking down the street and people come up and chat to your dad. And I just thought everybody knew my dad. I, did, I couldn't quite, you know, and I was very little. I couldn't work out why everybody seemed to have a conversation for him. <laughs> and he was really lovely at entertaining that and, you know, chatting to people. So, um, yeah, so I just grew up thinking that, that my dad was, you know, everybody's mate. <laughs> he was the man. <laughs> and that, you know, that kind of, like you say, that, that nomadic lifestyle, you know, for, for a lot of us now, we're so used to basing up and actually having some solid foundations is a great place to work for, for having a positive mindset and kind of having that root and that anchor and that calmness, I guess. Because that was your normal, did you kind of, did that feel quite settling that you were always moving or, or did it feel sometimes a bit chaotic when you were younger? Um, it's interesting because I, I didn't think it was. And I look back now and realise that the lot of reasons it became the norm and therefore it didn't feel chaotic, you know, because of the way my parents did it. When we got to Leeds when I was 10, I think my mum wanted to put some roots down. That's her hometown. And she wants to stay there because we were going to be getting to points in education where we needed to. Cool. And but interestingly, when I started gymnastics, I was then traveling all over the place for that, all over the country. You know, at the weekends I'd be on a train like 13 years old down to Bedford or down to Lillyshaw. And, you know, and then when I moved to university and then I'm, eventually I moved to London for work, 
I, my husband and I worked out that I, I think our kids had lived in like seven houses by the time they were eight. Cause we were always, and I look back and I think it's probably a legacy of that life, you know, that I, yeah. and my kids are really, really love roots. You know, they're really the opposite to me, you know, and I, um, we moved out of London about seven years ago and we're in the same house. It's the longest I've ever been in any house, you know, for seven years. And, um, and my kids are at, adamant that we're not moving ever again you know and i'm i'm always going oh look at this look at this and they're like what's wrong with you just stay in one place <laughs> and, I, and it's not because i'm not happy and i haven't got and i've got itchy feet and i'm searching for something i just i just like that kind of um i like emptying boxes and you know filling boxes up and kind of moving moving around and um but i'm i'm happy to stay where i am for now one day i came downstairs with a bright idea when they're about eight or nine that I said we'll go live in France for a year so they could really learn French nice. honestly you thought I just told them that I you know I had a serious drug habit and I was leaving to go <laughs> they looked at me so disgustedly you know they were kind of like why would you say these things to us? even my husband was like I don't want to go to France and learn <laughs> French so I've, yeah I've had to just you know I understand though you know that having roots and being grounded actually it is a nice thing I've learned to embrace it I think Nice, nice. And with the, because you kind of, you touched upon it there with obviously getting into gymna gymnastics so young. Um, was that something you always knew you wanted to do, Gabby? No, no, no. I, um, I really wanted to be a tennis player. And we lived in Vancouver for a while when my dad was playing there. And sport in Vancouver was just everything, like the way it weaved into life. You know, it wasn't a case of, you know, the kind of somebody you knew on the street went to play squash on a Friday, you know, it's like everybody did everything and played mm -hmm. ice hockey and basketball. And it was, and it was really easy and accessible. So playing tennis was not an elite thing. You know, it was just like, Oh, you got a racket. There's loads of courts. And then I came back to England and I was absolutely loved it. I was dead adamant that this is my sport, you know, and because in our family, you kind of had to have a sport, do you know, what I mean? like, yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> a bit like, you know, um, if you're playing in, if you're a musical family, everybody has an instrument, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. And I wish it had been that way around. Let me, let me tell you, but it wasn't, it had to be a sport. And so we came back to England and Leeds at the time had one indoor tennis court and it cost something like 2000 pounds a year to be a member of this club. Well, that was it. I was never going to be allowed to join this tennis club. So, I was dev I'm genuinely devastated. I was, my mum was, oh, the council court's open in July. And I was like, yeah, but it's October. <laughs> what am I going to do? <laughs> and so, um, so I started doing gymnastics purely, I think, because my mum probably encouraged it because my sister was doing it. So it was easier for my mum to drop two of us off tra training one, you know, one place. And I thought, I'll do that and see what, you know, what happens and where I, what, I'll find another sport. And I just got sucked into, you know, the, the beauty of it. And the, I love the training and I love the camaraderie. I love the, I love the fact that it was a group of, in my case, it was a girls gymnastics club. It was rhythmic gymnastics, a group of girls who were from totally different backgrounds all over the city. You know, it wasn't just school friends and it was nice to have a kind of something in common, but, and yet you all, you know, were from different places. And, and then when you start getting good at something and then it becomes quite addictive because you're, you know, you can see the improvement and I love the training and, you know, it, it was very um, intoxicating to be, you know, get, get sent a letter asking you to go for squad trials for Yorkshire and then for national squad. And soon you find yourself, you know, kind of 35 hours a week, you know, <laughs> training wow. and traveling around the country. So, yeah, it definitely wasn't. And if I was talent ID'd as a kid for which sport I would be best at, it wouldn't have been that. You know, I always like, Kenny and I always joke, like I probably should have been a cyclist or a swimmer or something, you know, but, um, but I kind of re rebelled against my body type and tried to squeeze myself into leotards for as long as possible. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, it was, um, and maybe, you know, maybe if football had been a sport that was available when I was a kid, I might have played football, but there were limited options for girls, you know, really and back then. And my school was, unfortunately it wasn't a, an amazing school but also we were in the middle of teacher strikes in the 80s so sport kind of went out the window um we played a bit of netball but that was that was all that was available so i think young girls now have got so many more choices things they can do and ways they can keep active and keep fit and um and hopefully they you know they take up those opportunities because yeah it was not plentiful back in the yeah. 80s no, and it's so wonderful that, that those opportunities now are available. I'm so um, so fascinated though, Gabby, because you were doing it, I think, from, you know, you're saying they're 13, even maybe a little bit younger. The the mindset, the, the dedication, the commitment, you know, the hours that you have to put in, it's tough enough if you knew when you were an adult that's, that's what you wanted to do. But as a, as a kid, when you kind of want to be doing everything, 
How was that just always in you or did you really have to work at that? And if you did, how? Um, I think it probably, I really wanted to be good at something and I, um, and I enjoyed, I think the, um, the craft of it, you know, and I think I also, I got completely obsessed by the brilliant people. So I was always watching videos of like the, the Eastern Europeans and, and measuring myself against them. They were the best, the Bulgarians and Russians were the best. And I think when you're, if something gets you when you're young, whether it's music or sport or, you know, it's, it could be something in science. I've got a, a neighbor who's a, the most wonderfully geeky 12 year old boy who's obsessed by physics, you know, and um, he's adorable and that's his thing. And you can see when a young person gets lit up by something, you know, and it just, for me, it happens to be that sport. And I think you can't make a child do something if they don't want to do it. That's what I've, I've learned about having teenagers, you know, because unfortunately, Kenny and I sometimes early on in our parenting, we'd kind of almost judge our kids' dedication to things against our own. And then we realized, you know, <laughs> they're not us and, and they have to, you know, you have to want to do it. You can't. And I have these debates with friends all the time who, you know, can you, because, you know, the Andre Agassi um, biography talks about his dad being such a tyrant in kind of the way he made him train and he, and yet he became Wimbledon champion. So, you know, there's an argument. Do you, do you keep pushing young people? But actually, I'm totally of the school that you should provide them with the, the opportunity if you can. But it has to come from them because otherwise they're going to resent it or they're not going to do it with any passion. And the one thing I always felt like was really important for me as a parent was that my kids had passions. And, you know, I wanted them to enjoy things for their own um, sake, not for me you know, I'm not living vicariously through them, you know. So, um, so that, I think that's what my parents were quite good at with, with our sport. Like, they didn't actually show much interest. You know? So they just kind of <laughs> went on with it. And it was like, yeah, when I went to the Commonwealth Games, I rang home after the opening ceremony to see if they'd spotted me on the telly. And apparently the BBC commentator, Barry Davis, must have had in his notes that my dad was, and I know how telly works now, he'd have had like, you know, there's a gym, gymnast for Wales. Her dad is the Welsh football manager. So they did spot me and said, oh, and there's Gabby Yorath and her dad is the Wales football manager. And I rang home and my mum said, yeah, we saw you. She said, you had some weird sunglasses on, you were chewing gum. And then she said, why are we not there? And I was like, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> you you're uh in Leeds um you could have got on a plane because I did you know so um so it's quite interesting they just kind of let us get on with it and um my dad never came to any competitions at all really my mom came to a couple um but she always like maintained oh, I've got four kids you're all doing sport everybody's busy but it's funny because I get so much joy from watching my kids play sport. And I think, oh, you really missed out because that's a really fun thing to do, you know, to, and I don't, you know, they were young, they were super busy and I understand it, but I, I feel for them that they didn't get to experience that. And live that with you, yeah. It's so interesting because touch upon that Agassi uh, biography, you talk about, you'd kind of assume if you have a, you know, someone like your dad who was a, a great footballer and really invested in sport would have been on your case, but it's so interesting hearing that actually it was the opposite for you and it, you were just left to self-motivate yourself and really put that time really, That did motivate me because he took my brother, my brother Daniel, who, who died when he was 15, was a brilliant footballer and he took his football really seriously. So Daniel, but they had this shared passion, which was football. And I guess my dad just didn't relate to my sport. And also he didn't understand, genuinely didn't understand why I was putting so much time and effort into something which wouldn't become a career because um, gymnastics, I mean, this was back in the day, there was no national lottery funding. You know, you, I got a sports aid grant once, which was a few hundred quid. There was no job at the end of the line. You know, as it was, it transpired quite a lot of gymnasts from my generation ended up going to things like Cirque du Soleil or they became dancers or, you know, so there were, there were things to do with your background. And I'm sure I wouldn't have been as applied as I was to my career without that training if you like you know but um my dad just didn't see it from him his perspective he was 15 years old when he was sent up to Leeds from Cardiff to become a footballer you know and he went on trial and that was it he got a contract he stayed mm -hmm. wrenched from his family you know that was the end of his family life effectively he was living in digs and those sacrifices were to get him a better life you know he came from a poor family um you know very working class background father was a docker you know his mum was a cleaner and that was a way out and so he saw that those sacrifices as worthwhile because there was an uh, you know there was a means to the end whereas for me he was a bit like well why are you giving up so much time doing that and I think, what's the end goal <laughs> yeah and so almost his indifference did inspire me then because i was kind of like i want to show you you know i want to i'm going to go and represent wales in the commonwealth games i'm going to represent great britain and um you know and so i suppose 
it was a, not that he would have done that in a way that was mean or, you know, there was no kind of maliciousness there, but it was subliminally probably me thinking, oh, I'm going to do this, you know, I'm yeah. going to show you. Quite inspiring, actually, is like that thing of, you know, just depending on what perspective you look at things, you know, yeah. you could look at it and, it and it'd be like, okay, that's going to stop me from doing it. Or you flip it on its head and go, no, I'm going to turn it around and turn it into a force of good. Yeah, because nobody was making me go to gym. You know, it was like, it wasn't, whereas there are days where, you know, my kids, not very often, but occasionally you'll see that a little bit of antipathy gets in and they go, I've got home. And I go, come on, you can get there tonight. You know, you can go. And they just need a little nudge. Whereas if I'd ever came home from school and said, I'm tired, brilliant. Okay, I'd have to take to gym tonight. <laughs> There's no kind of like, get in the car, get yourself, you know, get yourself changed. And it was the opposite. I used to have to, at the weekends, my trains were so early to get to training from Leeds to say London or wherever, that my mum used to make me wake her up with a cup of tea at 5 a.m. to get her out of bed. And then she would literally just throw a coat on over her pajamas and drop me off at the train station. But if I didn't wake her up, she wasn't waking up. <laughs> She was like, role reversal. Yeah, it was. She was like, a cup of tea, five o'clock. You know, get my get my windscreen de-iced and get the car ready for me, and then I'll take you down. So, there's yeah. little Gabby there, like running around the house, getting everything in order for your mum just to roll out of bed and take you. That's so funny. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, you touched upon it there, Gabby, um, about your brother Daniel, um, and if it was okay just to to kind of talk about that. Who obviously sadly passed away when when you were quite young. So. I mean, do you, do you want to say what happened for anyone who yeah, might not? Yeah. Was, um, I was 19 at the time. I'm the eldest and he was 15. I was in my gap year before university and I'd gone to live in London and was doing all kinds of uh, very boring jobs, actually. And my sister was living in uh, Tokyo. She'd just gone there. She was modelling. And my little brother, Jordan, was six, still at home, obviously. And uh, Daniel was a really talented footballer and he was signed to play for Leeds United. He was about two months off starting his professional career. He'd just coming to the end of his GCSEs. And it was uh, May 25th and uh, it was bank holiday Monday. And my parents had gone, um, were going out for dinner. My brother and my dad had played golf together during the day. And it was the, um, the PGA is always on that bank holiday Monday. And they were watching golf in the afternoon and they spent the whole day together. And then just before my parents were going to go out for dinner, my dad was having a kickabout in the garden with my brother. And um, he went over to pick up a ball that had just gone astray and fell over into some long grass and, my dad thought he was joking because he called him and he never turned around. And when my dad went over to him and turned him over, he, his eyes had rolled to the back of his head and he had no pulse. And um, effectively, he'd had a catastrophic heart attack and his heart had, had stopped working. And um, they didn't know at the time what, what it was. My mum thought he had heat stroke. My mum called an ambulance. And, and to, my mum didn't, even in the journey down to the ambulance, my dad was with him and my mum was behind. My mum was ringing her, her mum from the car saying, Daniel's got heat stroke, he's at St. James's Hospital and ringing like relatives to come down and see him because she just thoroughly, you know, she just expected him to wake up and, um, but he never did. And um, so it was the most um, shocking and, you know, unbelievably devastating thing to happen to a family because, we always debated about whether would we like to have known that he had this ticking time bomb and that, you know, we would we have had, if we'd had warning, what would it have changed? And, but to, there's no right or wrong way. There's no good or bad way to, to lose a child at all. But it was the, the shock of the whole thing, I think, which was so hard for everybody to, you know, to kind of assimilate and come to terms with. And, um, and everybody, you know, had started to leave the nest, you know, we'd, we were all leaving, leaving home. And it was that kind of, and my parents obviously just, you know, it was devastating for everybody in the long run. I ultimately, it was one of the factors that ended my parents' marriage. And, you know, it's taken, it's taken a long time to, um, the ramifications almost still carry on, really, in lots of ways. It's, how, because it is so heartbreaking and it, it, I don't think anyone can fully comprehend something like that until, you know, if it was to happen to them. But how... How do you could come through something like that, Gabby? And, and as well, I guess being an older sibling, did that kind of make you feel like you had a responsibility, much like a parent does in a way, you know, to kind of be the strong one, I guess. And I hate that phrase. but yeah. No, it's true because, and I guess because I was, um, I was the eldest and I was at home. So I was in London, but I, you know, obviously I was in the UK and my sister had, you know, was traveling all over the world and things. And I, I, I kind of assumed this role then of trying to help get everybody back together and so my mum would had started a property business and she um 
she just went to pieces. And so when I was at home, I, I just started doing things for her, trying to keep that going. And I stopped living in London, obviously. I came back before I went to university and spent those three or four months at home. And, um, and I did really take on this mantle of like trying to be, you know, resilient and seizing the day and living, you know, two lives and doing, you know, that kind of mentality I took for a while, for about a year through university. And just before my first year exams, I had a proper kind of, it wasn't a, a breakdown, but I had a very um, bad time. I was going to the doctors trying to get sleeping tablets and, and the doctor, you know, he didn't unfortunately ask me the right questions and, you know, just gave me sleeping tablets. And, and actually what I needed was some kind of counseling and I needed some kind of um, therapy really to help me understand what, what was going on in, in our lives really. And yeah. we didn't start doing that properly until after university actually. But at that time, luckily I'd, I had enough people around me who were able to help me kind of, you know, get back on with, with life without um, leaning on substances or things that were kind of, you know, masking and self-medicating, if you like, you know, which as a student would be a great temptation to, to do that, you know, because you're, you know, nobody's really controlling you. You've got no sense of um, boundaries or, you know, um, and so I some, somehow kind of got through that period um, like that. But it took me, I think, a few years when I first came to London, I saw this amazing acupuncturist and she, and she does five element um, Chinese acupuncture and she did a lot of talking with me as well. And um, because th then my parents' marriage was breaking up and, you know, there's so many other things kind of happening yeah. as, as, a, as I say, the ramifications of what that does to you as a family because you've got a couple who, no matter how solid the marriage is, they're leaning on each other almost, you know, and one person might want to do things one way. And like my mom was really into, she went to loads of different kinds of therapists and she read loads and she went to lots of different religious leaders and people to talk about, you know, what happens after we die. And she, you know, she just was really curious about everything about why we're here effectively. Yeah. It was always quite a spiritual person. We were brought up Roman Catholic, but we weren't really, you know, strong, strong Catholics or anything. So it wasn't that she was betraying the Catholic church or anything. And then my dad, who was, he converted to Catholicism, but he just didn't want to speak to anybody. He didn't want to talk to anybody. He didn't want to talk to a priest. didn't want to talk to his mates, you know? And so when, when people are dealing with things in a different way, it's very hard for that relationship then to survive, you know? And, and so that, you know, that was tough to live through as the eldest child. And I think people rightly when, you know, the first focus is for people is the parents when they lose a child, because no, but no parent ever expects to bury their child. It's not the natural order of things. But I think when I look back now, you know, none of us siblings were offered any kind of, you know, there was no kind of thing as grief counseling or anything like that. And you look now, there's so many great resources for children um, who are either bereaved from parents or siblings. And, and it's so important, I think, to my brother, who's sit, who was six, you know, he's he's had quite a few, you know, issues to wrestle with himself in his in his twenties, and um, and he, I'm sure, would have benefited at that time because to be yeah. six years old and see your brother die in front of you, um, you know, and then have to he was living at home and going through all of the, and I always felt for him because he wasn't getting the same childhood that we'd had because we had the building blocks, the foundations, you know, yeah. from that happy family kind of life, you know, so um, yeah, it's and I, you know. It's, it's enormously um, hard I think, for any family to, to lose a child, and no matter what age. I, it was, it's interesting hearing you there as well, Gavin, because, you know, even now we've still got a long way to go when it comes to talking around our mental health and the, you know, the different things that are available to us now to try and help understand and, and process our thoughts. But I guess, you know, when you, when you were 16 and of that time, the, the whole mental health conversation was, was non-existent. I guess. So that must, that just must've made it, you know, 10 times harder. And the fact there was, there was probably not even the understanding of what you might have been going through as a family and as individuals. Yeah. And, and, you know, for my dad as well, I think he'd come from this very macho kind of, you know, seventies, eighties football, very different to now where we have sports people speaking out about their mental health, which is so positive because, you know, they're supposed to be, we think of our sports people as these, you know, absolutely indomitable kind of, you know, hero warriors. And actually they're fragile, they're human. They have the same weaknesses and the same um, anxieties as the rest of us. And so my, my dad came from this very macho kind of environment and culture. And, um, and he was a very emotional man, you know, he, he was, or he cried a lot, but he wouldn't talk to people um, about what was going on. And um, I'm sure that if he, if this situation was happening now, you know, there would have been definitely there'd be more resources and there'd be more people to talk to. So we, we have come a long way um, in that respect. 
Um, and I think my mum's ability to process and to kind of not move on, you never move on. You know, it was my brother's anniversary last week. And even, you know, 28 years later, you know, she, she would never kind of, you know, that 6.30 that evening, she would never stop. And just, she just stops everything and thinks about him. And she thinks about him all the time. He's, he's always her son. Yeah. And so just going back to, to what you were saying before, coming through that then now, Gabby, you talked about taking responsibility was a way in which she for a little bit was able to go, okay, I'm going to push on through. Um, and then through being able to talk more, was sport then an, another outlet for you during that time? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I was coming to the end of my gymnastics and so that was really hard losing my competitive life and losing that time that I'd had and, you know, and moving on in life, you know, moving to university and, changing your um, kind of focus and things going on. And so sport was always important for me physically. I always knew that I felt better through doing sport, you know. Yeah. So, so I, I didn't probably kind of correlate it quite as, you know, as much as we now know scientifically, obviously, that, you know, that it is such a brilliant way of releasing endorphins and obviously we feel better for it. But I knew I was a better person for exercising. So I just ran at the time because I didn't really have anything else to do. I wasn't a gym member. I was a student. So I did lots of running, which was really healthy for, m- for my mind. Mm-hmm. But I also then, um, it was interesting because I, when I first started to work in football, I was working in local radio um, in Newcastle. I was doing the breakfast show. And because I always hung out with the sports team after my show, my show came off air at nine and I'd always be with the sports department chatting to them at the after my shift. So the boss said to me one day, I mean, he was quite canny because I was like 22 years old and I liked football. So he was like, would you like to do touchline interviews for us at St. James's Park? And I was like, what, is that a job? Can I do that on a Saturday? And he was like, yeah, yeah, that's what, you, that's what, you know. We, and basically they were getting, the bloke who'd been doing it was in his late 60s. And I think they thought I might have a better chance of the place <laughs> on the pitch. And it's kind of reverse sexism, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but it was an opportunity for me to do something that I just thought was fun. I didn't see it necessarily as a career. And, um, and it's interesting because then I, I started to realise that these players were, oh, he would have been a contemporary of my brother's. And I look at their birth dates on, um, you know, in the programs and think, oh, they're the same age as Daniel. And, and then started imagining kind of, you know, the, well, I did it regularly thinking about what his career would have been like. And, and it was a kind of way of staying connected almost to, to him that, um, you know, and I'd often s- sit and say to my mum, oh, imagine if like, you know, because Leeds United obviously were doing brilliantly as well in, you know, in the um, late 90s, early 2000s. And, um, and so I suppose subconsciously, my desire to be around that world might have been also a, a connection, you know, to, to him and his life. And this brings me perfectly to my, to my next question, because you, you talked about there the transition then into, into broadcasting. You were definitely doing it that at a time when it was a very male dominated environment. And you could argue actually still is a, a, a bit to, today actually, but especially when you were breaking through Gabby, that must have been tough in itself. And I, I was just wondered how, how did you go about, you know, persisting in a world that was, that was very male dominated and kind of, you probably hadn't seen that many, you know, females doing your job at that time? Yeah, there were, there were no women really doing, um, well, I think Sue Barker had started to do Wimbledon around then and Helen Ronson had started the BBC. But when I went to Sky, you know, there were very, very few women in front of the screen and the, um, the, the, the environment was very different to, to now. Office culture in any industry was very different, you know, in the late 90s. It wasn't just Sky Sports. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but it was, a, it was a very macho. People said things that, you know, they just wouldn't get away with now. Um, and I think at first I thought I had to, because um, I'd done a year in local radio and then got this opportunity to go to Sky to do a show called Sports Centre, which was like Sky Sports News. And, um, and they were kind of rebranding and everything. And it was a big launch and it was all very exciting. And it was, it was, it was super exciting. But I, I just didn't, um, I didn't want to lose my identity. You know, I didn't want to lose my femininity. I wanted to not morph into the kind of macho characters who were around to think that's the way I was going to get on. So that was quite tough at first. I was quite self-conscious about that. After about a year or so, I realised that I wasn't necessarily the person that I wanted to be. You know, I was kind of adopting traits and doing things that were just not really me. So, um, and it was the lad, ladette culture was going on as well at the time, you know, so there was all of that thing happening. And, um, and so it was quite a strange, um, yeah, it was quite a strange pivotal period, I think, for, um, for, for sports broadcasting anyway, because Sky had, you know, only been going six or seven years and uh, football was changing. It was exciting, but um, I'm lucky, I think, because I, 
or maybe I recognized a few people who were my supporters and mentors, you know, people that I am. Um, and they were, they were men, you know, there was a, a boss I had who was brilliantly encouraging. And I think when you have those people, you have to hang on to them. You know, if you see somebody who sees something in you and you want to, and was really good at, you know, tr training me effectively and taking that kind of um, leap of faith with me as well. So, um, so I think I, yeah, I kind of rode through it in a, <laughs> uh, came out slightly, you know, slightly different, but not too unscathed from, you know, from of the experience. But it was, um, it was definitely, I, I definitely prefer the environment we work in now, Kel. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I bet, I bet. And the uh, support networks actually are, are so important, aren't they? I mean, obviously for you when you were younger, you, it was your family. And then you talked about there in your broadcasting career, those mentors. Having those comrades around you, Oh, I think is everything, isn't it? In whatever it is that you do in your yeah. life. And there are certain, you know, you'll know, I'm sure there are certain producers now that I work with who I get on better than others and enjoy the environment that they create at work and want to, so that when they ask you to do something that, you know, you're technically not really contracted to do, you do it for them because you really want to help them out with something and you want to promote the show that they've got, or you want to do a little bit extra to make it work. Um, and those people, there's a loyalty that goes obviously both ways then, isn't there? That you, you know, you look out for each other. And, and, and sometimes it's just because you have the same sense of stupid sense of humor or you, you know, you like the same music or you have, um, you know, you, you like going to the same restaurant, whatever it is, you just gel with people. And I think that's what makes, that's what makes work human, isn't it? That's what makes the yeah. working environment, you know, some, somewhere that we can enjoy. And, and if you like your job, obviously that's a good start. And, you know, and, and I think I would feel privileged and really delighted that I enjoy my job because it would be horrible to you know to have to go to work every day hating it and and then when you find people you like working with that also is a really lovely experience because you know whatever you know it's tv obviously nobody's it's not going down a mine I'm not doing brain surgery but it can get stressful you know when you've got kind of live tv and lots of things going on and it's all quite you know you've got political things happening around the show or thing you know so so those kinds of environments if you don't enjoy it you'd feel quite, I think, quite beaten by it quite early on. So, um, so yeah, you're right. It is so important to recognize people who are kindred spirits, if you like, who, you know, you can, you can grow with in your career. Yeah. Hold on to, isn't it? You're there. I've got you. We're in this together. Um, I mean, and off that then, you know, cause you, you, you do do so much Gabby and there is so much that you have to, to think about when it comes to your work, but then you've also got your family life. How do you strike that balance between you know work and then personal i i don't necessarily believe that you can have it all <laughs> you know i think you have to some things have to be sacrificed and that might be that i've not spent enough time with my mates you know what I mean? because at the weekends i want to do things if i'm not working i want to do things with my kids and you know so so you can't you know and luckily i've managed to retain my, my really good friendships are still there and they're still solid because I think we realize that, okay, if, it go, if we go two or three months without going out for dinner, it doesn't mean that it's over. You know, we're grown ups. We can pick this up again and we can, and we've all got those same juggles. And I, you know, I so, say, so I think you, you, you know, things kind of like my mum always used to, she loves going out, my mum, you know, she's always been a Saturday night person. And, and it, she's only just stopped being disappointed if I'm not out on a Saturday night. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I'd rather be in with the kids and Kenny and, you know, have a nice meal together and, you know, play a board game or do something because I'm not here all the time. I am working. And, and so I think it is striking that kind of balance in your life. What, what makes you happy? You know, so it's, um, it's what you want to do and not feeling guilty about times when you do things that are for yourself, you know, that um, like exercise is my thing. And, you know, that makes me feel happy. And I think makes me probably a better mum. So, you know, that, that's why I, you know, I, justify that time being spent on that um and then you know your as your kids get older as well it's that learning to release them a bit isn't it as well and learning to let them do things that without you and you know not micromanaging their lives and and then working out that you're going to have a bit of time for yourself back and what you're going to do with it so i think it's it's a juggle constantly it's about being organized and you know it's about trying to put things in you know the right priority it's kind of like a you know is that, is that the thing that we should be focusing on right now? Or is this the thing, you know, and having obviously, you know, you're in a relationship, your partner having similar ideas about what, you know, what you both want to achieve from it and being a team. I think it comes back to teamwork, doesn't it? And, yeah. um, and whether your team is made up of an, an, an orthodox mom, dad, 2.4 kids, whether it's two mums and five kids, whether it's two dads and two kids, whether it's three people, adults living in a house, whatever it is, it's a team. And, you know, um, 
I'm kind of, I love having more adults to stay. You know, like say we get a relative who wants to stay for a few days or, you know, because I like the idea that everybody mucks in, you know, so yeah. Kenny's mum wants to come down for a few days to stay with us or I've got an auntie who used to come a lot when they were little because it's that, that idea that, you know, it takes more, you know, that African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child, you know, and I, and I really like that idea that it's not just down to us two. <laughs> no, not. <laughs> Take all the responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> Plus in this day and age as well, it, I think having people around is, is more important than ever. Trying to navigate through this world on your own, it's so tough. And that's what this whole experience in lockdown has been hard for people, hasn't it? Because I think, um, you know, if you're, if you're used to that kind of, you know, having a lot of people around and, and you, you don't have that, it's quite tough. And I see people in, like with a Thursday night clap, we go out in the street and I'm, I've got talking disease because I'm like, oh, hi, how are you? And, <laughs> and my son said to me, mom, you were out for 40 minutes for the clap tonight. <laughs> I was like yeah I know you know because you just realize how much you miss your neighbors and your community and people that you you know you interact with yeah human connection is is everything I love that I love the image I've got of you just like chatting but still <laughs> clapping for 40 minutes like catching up with it but not, not stopping clapping <laughs> <laughs> um finally then Gabby because um well in two parts you touched upon the exercise and, and having your team is there anything else that you found is is, is good for you, for your well-being and when things are maybe getting a bit chaotic whether in work or in life that are like you're okay this is how I'm going to try and get my sense of calm uh, you know definitely exercise um, whether it's and changing that up actually so you know it might be that this is working for me now I love yoga at the moment or I love doing a bit of bar I'm interested in my weights I like to run just keeping that those for me I have to kind of mix things up you know I like to change it around and not get into too much of the you know a routine and I do um I still will see try and see the acupuncturist who helped me so much in my early 20s I still try and see her a few times a year it's like a little MOT you know just tweak things a little bit just make sure everything's on track and I had this amazing mentor guy called Ed Percival who worked with me at Sky and then when I left Sky he, he just carried on and just helped me out when I used to call him before things like an Olympics I'd call him and say right Olympic Games going to going to Beijing next week you know and he'd say right let's have a coffee and he'd just tweak things and say oh I've noticed when you're asking questions sometimes that you're loading your questions with the answer or you know he'd, he'd be really really good at performance stuff and sadly he died um three years ago four years ago coming up and I miss him so much because I you know he as a friend as a guide and as a mentor and and I've, I've tried to kind of replicate that relationship with other people and it's just it's just not the same so I think by going to my acupuncturist it just because she knew him as well so it's kind of like a link you know to to just keep you know and, and reading and taking your mind off somewhere completely different I think is really good you know so reading something that's totally unrelated to my work because I do a lot of reading for work but that's not always enjoyable or nourishing so um, and I think sometimes if I'm getting a bit stressed and busy I notice that I'm not eating as well and you know I think food plays a huge part in mood and um and in your and I see it with my kids all the time as well you know it's I'm not talking about e-numbers and sweets you know they're a bit older but I know when they're stuffing their face with you know like white flower products you know because they <laughs> kind of like I'll, I'll see you know I've got a big son you know he's six foot five he's 14 he can eat a lot of food and it's hard to keep him packed with nutrition but I, he's noticed as well during this lockdown I'll say like, have you eaten a loaf of bread today or something? And he's like, yes. <laughs> 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 so, I think food is really important in retaining that kind of balance. Massively. Um, finally, Gabby, where, where is your happy place? Right here, I think, actually. Yeah. At home, yeah. I think it's, it's where I, I feel like I just, you know, the shoulders go down, you come in and you breathe. And you know, I'm, I'm, we live a little bit out of London. We've got bit of countryside around us and I really really value seeing trees and going for a walk and hearing animals and seeing animals and um and so I think I never thought I'd be a country person I've been a city person my whole life and um and I love I love going into the city still it took me a few years to really feel grounded here but I think I don't think I could live without nature now you know without a bit of a bit of greenery around and you know yeah, it's, um, I'm a convert because my husband's a farmer, so he's been waiting for me to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Next will be when he's coming in with a pack of cows and some chickens and it's like, well, oh, too far. No, definitely, no, he's definitely, he's, um, we, if it was up to him, yeah, we'd have a garden full of cows. But um, yeah, um, I'm just keeping that. We've got a few animals, but no cows yet. <laughs> yeah. I have to trade it off, go, all right, you can have the cows if we go to France for a year. When we yeah. come back. That, yeah, I think that ship might have sailed now. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> um, Gabby, thank you so much for your time and, and, and just speaking so openly and honestly as well. It's, it's been really fascinating. It's very easy, Kel. Thank you so much. You're, nah. you're easy to talk to. Thank and, you. Thanks, Gabby. If you like that video, there are loads more talks, classes and exclusive videos from the Happy Place Virtual Festival. So don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. Do follow us on Instagram for constant updates and enjoy.